one. Hello again. I'm going to relate to you a very, very personal story. Um, one that I've planned on telling for quite a while, but just had to get my head around sharing this online. It has to do with a very dear friend of mine, the dearest of friends, who held a uh, prominent place in my life for quite a while. And this is a strange story of an unusual person. And I call it uh, the angel, the Berlin angel, as in Berlin, Germany. The Berlin angel und die Hexen. And Hexen is German for witches. Hexa would be witch, Hexen, witches. And I go into this prayerfully and reverently. Um, you know, would this person want me sharing this? Sometimes I think no. Sometimes I don't, I don't know, maybe so. Yeah, I'll tell you this, if I get the slightest word from anybody or inclination of any sort at all, sort of all, that this should not be public, I will, uh, unlist this video. Until then, if that should happen, I'm going to go ahead and go forward with it. I don't need the hourglass. I'm not going to keep time on this one. <clears throat> All right, where do I start? Um, I have a few photographs that I'm going to put up, and I gave that a lot of thought to. Uh, privacy, you know, respect privacy. And, uh, I'm not going to tell this person's name, but I will share photographs of that time period of her and I. And um, she went by the nickname of Angel in uh, Berlin. Her hometown was Berlin, Germany. And her nickname was Angel there. And everybody called her Angel. I called her Angel, I called her, you know, by her name, whatever. A very unusual person. And uh, a case for witchcraft, because I never really believed in such, took it seriously. Um, I didn't then at first. I'm trying to think where to dig this very personal story about somebody I loved very much. Um, I was in my 20s and up or into my 30s and uh, would go to Berlin. All right, I'll start out. I met her in upstate New York, actually, at my parents' house. Um, I finished my first four-year hitch at Fort Bragg in the 82nd Airborne. And at that time, I thought I was uh, done with the Army. Uh, my uh, marriage had recently split up. And um, there's nothing I could do about that, nothing. And uh, so I got out of the Army to try to see if I could salvage that, which I couldn't for reasons I won't state, but I did try. I actually well, I had a top secret clearance uh, right before I got out of the 82nd. Uh, I took a test, language aptitude battery, defense language aptitude battery test, and I did really well on it. And uh, the United States... Army was going to pay me a lot of money to go to Monterey, California, the Presidio for a year and um, <clears throat> learn to speak Russian. And basically, I would be a plain clothes. They just told me my job was classified. I could grow a beard, wear plain clothes. I was in my, I was like 24 at this time, all right? Don't picture all this age and <laughs> 50 pounds lighter, too. That's life, right? That's the way it goes. Um, so, and I had a top secret clearance. I was going to get paid a lot of money to learn to speak Russian. And 
I was basically going to be a spy. They said my job would be to hang out in the bars, hang around the streets, around where the Iron Curtain used to be, and just file a report every day on whatever I heard people talking about, you know. Unfortunately, my marriage fell apart at Fort Bragg during this time. Of, I was getting ready to make that move, and uh, I suddenly abruptly decided to get out of the Army and try to save my marriage. So I went home to my parents' house in upstate New York, and I couldn't save my marriage. There was, I'm not going to say why, but it was just irrevocably over. And uh, lo and behold, I won't say how they got there because I need to respect other people's privacy. But Angel was living there with her mother, and right out of Berlin. So I wound up sharing a house with her, and we became really good friends. From the minute we laid eyes on each other, uh, we hit it off, really hit it off. I mean, in one sense, I'm going to say that she was uh, had some unusual spiritual properties about her, you know, you decide for yourself after I'm done telling this story. On the other sense, she was just a young woman. I mean, at the time she smoked cigarettes, she quit, and she liked to have a beer, and she liked uh, metal music, and, um, you know, music of the time period, and she liked to dance, and uh, she was very attractive, very, very attractive. Standout attractive. Standout attractive. And I wasn't so bad myself then. So we hit it off. <laughs> and uh, we had a good time together, talking. She spoke English, pretty good English. And her English got really good. Actually, you couldn't even hear an accent. She had German accent at first. But she got to speaking English so well, real fast, that... I couldn't even hear an accent from her, and nobody could really. She, she was really, she ranked then. She ranked as one of the most intelligent people I'd ever met. One of the most intelligent people I'd ever met, man or woman. And we had a lot of good times uh, going to the clubs, in small clubs, every once in a while, not often. We did all kinds of things together. Um, Went through old abandoned houses in the countryside, went for walks, went to the lake, sat up and talked about things, had beers together, listened to music. I had a car, we'd drive around. She liked that a lot. Um, she was a city girl from Berlin, and she really loved upstate New York where I was living. She thought it was beautiful. She said upstate New York was as beautiful as anything she'd seen in Switzerland or other places that are acclaimed. Uh, she thought the mountains were beautiful up in the Adirondacks, and I drove her all over the place. I was more than happy to be uh, her host. Um, now here's where the strangeness gets in, all right? I'll get to what I'm telling about this. Um, I was terribly enamored with her, completely. So I was a young man, impressionable, fresh out of a divorce where I felt alone and heartbroken and rejected and suddenly this young woman, this beautiful young woman, intriguing young woman from Berlin is telling me that I'm worth a lot as a human being, that I was a very worthy, unusual human being and that I need to stand up for myself and don't worry about what these other people have said, you know, how I was discarded or something in my marriage and things. And I needed, I, I was an exceptional person. And so she was really kind of what I needed right then and there. And I think she meant it. I don't think she was just trying to give me a pep talk because she liked me quite a lot too. Um, well, I was a devout Christian then. Like I am now, or I'm trying to be, you know, I was trying then. I'm saying I was perfect. She hadn't been too exposed to Christianity in Germany at that point. Um, she was, 
she wanted to know, at first she mocked my beliefs about Jesus. And when I told her, you know, the, and the Holy Spirit and how to invite Jesus into her life and become saved, she mocked it at first. And then she wanted to be saved. And this is where things got a little strange. We'd be walking out in the woods together and we'd sit down by a creek and I'd tell her about Christ. And she wanted to, she told me she wanted to become a Christian, but she couldn't. And I said, all you have to do is believe and just ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Just all you have to do is say it, you know, and she would get hysterical. I mean, it was bewildered me. She went, ah, ah, she, she'd get hysterical, like she was being tormented mentally or spiritually. I'm like, well, what's going on? She said the others, she called them the others. Uh, she said they were really bad, really bad ones, she said. I wrote all this down years ago. Thank God, because I just reread it, revisited it, what I wrote. And I'm glad I wrote it down. But she called them the others. She said the really bad ones. She said they did not want her uh, accepting Jesus Christ. They didn't want her having anything to do with Christianity. And they knew what she was saying, what she was doing. And I said, Angel, there's nobody around here. It's just me and you. Don't be afraid. You know, we're, just, we're out in the woods sitting on a beautiful summer day next to a stream, as I recall. It was very, very beautiful. There was nobody around. I mean, we were out there. We, we used to go for hikes in the woods a lot and stuff. And she, I said, just accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And she'd get hysterical in a really weird way. And she said, the others, they know, they know. I said, how can they know? She said, they know what she's thinking. They know what she's doing. They know what I'm saying. And they didn't want her to have anything to do with Christianity. And she told me they were going to punish her for even entertaining the idea of becoming saved by Christ. And that really caught my attention. I've never didn't know what to say, but she was really hysterical and in anguish. I, I really at the time didn't know what to think. I thought maybe what she's saying has some truth. I thought maybe this is just a young woman fantasizing about, you know, things. I didn't know. I didn't take it too serious at first. But I did know it was was bizarre, and she did. And we had talks again. She told me that I was the only person she knew. The reason she was talking to me about Jesus, because she didn't know anybody else in Germany, or her brief time in New York, that really had a relationship with Christ. And she said she thought that I did. She she said I was the only person that she believed did. And um, she wanted to come to Christ. And once again, I just told her, you know, basically all you have to do is believe in him. You know, John 3, 16, you know, and told her the good news. And she would go hysterical. I mean, like she's being tormented, shrieking out and stuff. You know, I said, just say it. You know, just accept it. I tell her, you're with me. You don't need to be afraid. God will protect you. And the closer she got to accepting Jesus Christ, the more tormented and hysterical she got. So this happened several times. One time, all right, I was with her. I've never had this happen before or since, and I'm not making this up. And I was really, she was gorgeous. And, um, just captivating uh, person, personality and intellect as well, a top of gorgeous. She had it all going on. And you'll see maybe in some of the pictures, you might see what I'm talking about. You might not. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Um, one time I was sitting up with her. I think we had candles going, you know? She liked candles too. She would have liked this whole setup. Um, she, I don't know that she would have liked me sharing this with you publicly. Not too many people know of this. Uh, 
that's good. I, I did go into this prayerfully. Well, so we're sitting up and we're close, you know what I mean? We're, we're close to each other and I'm just looking into her eyes and she's looking into my eyes. And I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, I'm 20, 25 years old at the time. And she says to me, she says, I know what you're thinking. And she's looking me right in the eyes with a big smile on her face. I said, I'm sure you do know what I'm thinking. You know, in a human fleshly kind of way. And she goes, no, no, I really know what you're thinking. I said, and I'm sure you do know what I'm thinking. She says, no, I know what you're thinking. And I'm like, What's the, where's she going with this something? I'm saying, all right, I said, so what am I thinking? And she's still looking me in the eyes. She's got me transfixed. She's got a smile on her face. And she starts laughing a little bit. And she started saying every word verbatim that bubbled up in my thoughts. Every word. Like, oh, no. She'd go, oh, no. And she would say it in the same. She'd speak it. As soon as I thought it, she spoke it. In the same tone of voice that I'm thinking, like, oh, my God. What? How can she? You know, what? How? How can he? And she's like, oh, my God. What? How can she? Everything I thought. How is she doing it? How is she doing it? She would parrot it back to me the same way I was saying it. And while she was doing this, I'm looking at her stunned. And she's laughing louder and louder and still parroting every thought I thought. I'm not making this up. Finally, it, it started to torment me. And she was still speaking every thought I thought or sound like uh, uh, she go, uh, uh, anything that came up in my mind and I said stop 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 and at that point she stopped and she started laughing even harder <laughs> I tell you what I never forgot that um, all right so let me move forward in this story uh, everything comes to a close with time and she and her mother who were extremely close both of them the closest I've ever seen a parent where they were inseparably close I mean very close I won't mention any names just her nickname Angel well I wound up going back in the army uh, active duty after six months and the same day that I left to go back to active duty as a training sergeant, actually in Whitehall, New York, where some of my other stories come in, um, she left for back for Berlin with her mother. And so we said our goodbyes, and I swore I would come see her. And I uh, told her that I wanted to marry her as well. But we weren't really talking about that at that point in time. Um, so I saved. My, I went and got my, went to work and active back in active duty army. And she went back to Berlin to where she lived in Altmaringdorf, a very peaceful residential district, out on the uh, in Berlin outside of the Kudam and Kreuzberg, where the build up buildings were then. As long as the Berlin, as well as the Berlin Wall, which was still up then, it was about to come down. Um, we wrote all we have were letters and and payphone. There was no the internet wasn't widespread yet, though it was coming in. And even when it came in, uh, she didn't want to be on the internet. She told me she didn't want anybody to find her. She wanted to stay off the radar. So if I wanted to talk to her, it had to be by phone phone call or letters and I still got her letters and we used to back in I think it's a lost art writing letters we used to write letters and I used to put poetry on them and draw pictures the best I could of you know whatever on the borders of my letters I'd draw pictures and I wrote her fantastic letters and she wrote fantastic letters back to me adorned with drawings and she had a very beautiful handwriting. 
So I saved up my money. You know, I am. I'm going to go see her in Berlin. And I took some leave, two or three weeks of leave from the Army. Grew my hair out a little bit. Just, I didn't want to look military when I went there. So I'm going to show you a picture here pretty soon of her and I and a couple other people. I won't say who they are. And uh, my hair looks kind of long for being in the military. And I really stretched it as much as I could and grew my hair out. And uh, back then, all you could grow was a mustache in the Army, right? In the minute, you still can't uh, grow a beard. So I had a mustache. Mustaches were in then anyway, so Tom Selleck and all that. So I went to Berlin, and this was my first overseas trip. And I have to tell you, in my life, if I could go back and revisit any time in my life, it would be my time spent with her. All of it. All of it. In Berlin and in New York, upstate New York, in the countryside. I got to the airport. I remember sitting on this airliner going over to Germany, and I'd never done that. I'd flown a lot in the Army. Big difference, flying over an airliner. I remember sitting in the back, and there was a lot of German college students returning back to German, to Berlin, after a stay in New York. And... Uh, Man, the stewardesses were all speaking English in New York, but by the time we got halfway over the Atlantic, everybody, including the stewardesses, were speaking German, which I speak and spoke some then. Uh, she was a very good teacher. And, uh, man, we, I drank beer with these college students, and uh, I, I was ready to go. I got to Berlin, and they were waiting for me. Big party, balloons, champagne. Uh, big sign, welcome Timothy, on front of their house. They really rolled the red carpet out for me, her and her mother. Her and her mother lived together. And here's a picture of her and I. I re actually recall this moment. Uh, here it is. Her and I sitting in her backyard with two other people, um, her brother and sister. And she's in the black dress, sitting across the table from me in the black dress, gown, whatever you want to call it. And she really knew how to dress up. And that's me looking goofy, I don't know, self-conscious, something, I don't know, just a picture. And their backyard, and we sat back there quite a bit. Had breakfast, lunch, uh, drank beers, talked. And behind their house was an uh, old cemetery, large one. And it was full of a lot of World War II dead buried in there. And you never know, it was so peaceful there. Um, I want to talk about their house. Uh, it looked really old. Their whole street was very quiet, peaceful, well-kept, you know, like cobblestone streets. And the buildings all looked old, but they weren't. Uh, I went down in the basement of their house and saw that there was plywood and two by fours, modern building materials. All right, picture off. Modern building materials used throughout the house. So the house looked old from the outside, but in the basement was a stone foundation, really old stonework by my estimate, and really old cork bottles and old things in their basement of their house. And the whole area was bombed flat in World War II. And I did some gardening work for her and her mom. And digging in their backyard there where that picture was taken, a flower garden, um, I didn't have to go but that far beneath the dirt and started coming up through dirt and flowers. All of a sudden I came into rubble and twisted metal and I uh, even found some Nazi money with swastikas on it. And World War II was not far under the soil. And in their backyard, I'll tell this war story, uh, there was a red-haired man who was then about my age, um, and he was back in the backyard cutting wood. Nice enough guy. He didn't speak any English, but I spoke German good enough that I could carry on a conversation. And, of course, I had to ask. We got to talking in the backyard, and I asked him about World War II. And, yes, he served in the infantry, and he served on Italy, and he served in France against the Americans and British. And... Uh, 
I asked him, I shouldn't have asked him, I asked him, did you see any action, anything? And he said, oh yeah, he said he experienced quite a bit of bad stuff, uh, horrible stuff. Um, he said, but funny thing is, he didn't doesn't remember it, he just remembered the funny things. And uh, they were doing a river crossing, his unit, and uh, we're getting shot to pieces by the Americans on the other side of the river. And his people were getting killed to his right and left, and he wasn't even worried about that. All he was worried about was he had to go to the bathroom really bad, number two. And as soon as that boat hit the other side of the riverbank with half the people on it dead, he ran and jumped into a foxhole, whipped his pants down, and did his business. And to his surprise, there was an American soldier in that foxhole staring at him. And he said he was terrified until he realized the American was dead. And he said that was war, and he told me some of his war experiences. So I got to hear some of their side stuff, and my father was a World War II vet, American side. And, you know, growing up, uh, I always like to talk to veterans from all armies and try to get their experiences. Um, moving on. All right, let me move on. I'm just telling my memories. Oh, we had the best time there. Her and I, we used to go out dancing. She showed me the city, Berlin. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it then. And the wall, the Berlin Wall was still up. I saw East Berlin, which was about to end. The communism was almost done. And uh, it was such a contrast, the communist side of Berlin versus uh, the, the western side. It was like night and day. It was just gray and dark and poor looking. You know, it was just, there was an oppression hanging over it. Just dark. It didn't seem like anybody was having a good time on the other side of the wall anywhere. I could go on about that. I wound up on the wrong. I wound up on East Berlin with her briefly, and that was kind of scary, especially me being in the American military. And the Cold War was still on, though it was just about over at that point. All right, I'm going to move on. Um, move on to her and the, the Hexen, the witches. This is the strange part of this story, probably. <clears throat> I slept alone in their house. I slept upstairs. They called it the pink room. I don't know. Her and her mom slept downstairs. They shared a room while I was there, and I slept upstairs in a room by myself. One night, I was sleeping, and these, her and her mom usually went to bed around 9 p.m. You know, we might sit up and have a couple beers and talk. Then get ready to go to bed. The end. So I went to bed that night, and I had a dream, a strange dream. And in that dream was Angel and her mother, I almost said their names, just like from the chest up. I couldn't see the rest of them. It was kind of faded out. But from their chest up, there they were. And they were both looking at me in the dream, Head to head, like, you know, like that. Her head and her mother's head, they're like together close. And they're both looking at me and her, their mother's just laughing and staring at me and going laughing, like real low laughing. And Angel said, shall we tell him, mother? In the dream, and her mother like laughing, like, no, no, don't, no, no. She didn't, her mother didn't speak English. No, no, no. And she says, mother, shall we tell him? And they're both looking at me, smiling, and their, their mother's going like this. And she goes, no, 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 no. She says, I'm going to tell him, mother. And her mother didn't say anything, just smiling at me like that, kind of looking. And um, she said, we're, this is our birthday. She said, we're witches. This is our 437th birthday. And she said, we come here, and they both transformed in front of me. As she's telling me that they're witches, both of them transformed from what they looked like as I knew them, two blonde-haired women, mother and daughter, into hideous-looking monsters. I mean, dark, twisted faces, barely looked human, terrifying-looking, hideous-looking. And they both started laughing real loud. And she said, we keep coming back just to mess with guys like you. 
and started, they both started laughing really, really, really loud. And they looked hideous. I mean, scarcely human. And they're laughing and they're staring looking at me. And then I woke up, poof. And the next thing in this room, and I was the only one upstairs, was I could hear the door, the heavy door, latch, clack, clack, open up. I could hear it turn and open with a loud clack. And uh, I gotta get my dog something so he'll stop bugging me. Come on, let's go. Go, get it. All right, he always does this. All right, so the door, when I woke up from them, that dream, strange dream, all right? I won't recover it like I almost did. I tend to repeat myself too much. I, as soon as I woke up from that, I heard the door in the room, clack, clack, and then it slowly opened up the door. And I'm looking over, and the hallway light was on, and there's nobody there to be seen. But the door opened very slowly, and I heard it open. I heard it clack, clack, the handle being turned. And I'm laying there in bed, wide awake, and it's semi-dark in the room because the street lights and the hallway lights were coming in at this point. And I sensed something that I generally don't sense too often, but I sensed another presence in the room. And I sensed that it was flying around in circles around the room, up by the ceiling, another spirit. And I thought to myself, I'm not alone down here, or I'm not alone here. I just knew I wasn't alone. Uh, whatever opened that door came in, I didn't feel threatened or afraid. I didn't know what to think yet. I hadn't really put it all together. But I sensed something was flying around in circles up by the ceiling, a spirit of a, a spirit. And then I heard laughter coming from downstairs. And at that point, I'm like, what's going on? It was 3 a.m. And uh, I, I'm not making this up. I went downstairs. I, th I thought, well, what's going on? I heard them laughing. And I thought, they, they're up and they, should, they usually invite me. They included me in on everything, her and her mother. They really liked me a lot. And... Um, so I got up and got dressed and I went downstairs to see what was going on. And when I went downstairs, I took this picture as soon as I walked into their living room and there they were. And if anybody sees this and tells me to take it down, I will. Because I post this stuff reluctantly. Well, not reluctantly, I wanted to tell this, but I want to make sure I'm not offending anybody at all. And I want to pay tribute to them, um, even though this is a strange story. So they were down there having a party. All right, I told you before, she smoked and she liked to drink. Not a lot. She didn't drink a lot. She, she didn't like drunkenness, but she did like to enjoy a beer once in a while. There's a difference. And so did her mother. Her mother liked champagne, as I recall in wine. She wasn't a beer drinker. And I said, what's going on? right after I took this picture. And the mother was laughing like she was in a dream, looking at me like she is in the picture here. The same look. And she said, it's our birthday party. Then Angel said this. Angel spoke English. The mother didn't speak much English at all, uh, just German. And she said, it's our birthday party. I said, what? You know... Because I knew it wasn't their birthdays, either their birthdays. I said, she says, yes. She said, we're 437 years old. And then they both started laughing. And I really didn't know what to think. I was amazed. I wasn't frightened or anything um, at all. And, uh, but I was really amazed. And at that point, I said, all right, happy birthday. <laughs> I didn't tell them what happened upstairs. Um, honestly, I think that they sent something to summon me to come down and join them. That's what I think happened firmly. That these two witches sent something upstairs.
to summon me to come downstairs to join them. So I sat up and just had a few drinks with them, and we listened to some music. Uh, the mother loved Elvis a lot, and Elvis Presley, and daughter liked contemporary rock, um, American rock, stuff a lot of you've heard, you know, heavy metal and such. And then I went back up and went to bed. And that's the end of that event. But after that night, I started thinking more along the lines that maybe she wasn't making this up. And I will just say I went back to New York. I had to. I had to work. Um, I did propose to her. She accepted. But she she couldn't leave her, her mother and come to New York and I understood that and so we never, it never happened. Um, she would, I revisited a couple of times and had just as good a time every time with her in her company. I'd go on and on about that but we had great time together. High adventure in the city and just we just clicked. We were like two I don't know, we are young and wild and free, and we had that whole city, you know, and uh, we had a really, really good time going. We wouldn't come home till sunup. Quite often when we returned back to Altmer and Dorf, her, and her street, uh, which I won't say, but I remember, and Hessenrink, um, the sun was coming up and the birds were starting to chirp. We had some really good times just out, out and about the city. But when I was back in New York, um, I used to get phone calls from her occasionally. Uh, I got phone calls from her a lot, actually. Um, but occasionally I get a phone call from her where she was hysterical, like she, hysterical, asking me to pray for her, pray for her, pray for her, pray for her. Please pray for me, pray to Jesus for me. Uh, she said the others were angry with her. They were going to get her that they were angry with her for wanting to leave to become a Christian. And she asked me over and over, please pray for me. She was hysterical, frightened, hysterical. It was bizarre. More than once she did that, and she was so frightened. She said the others were going to punish her. For, and she said, again, she said, the really bad ones, some of the really bad ones of the others. And by the others, they came to be known as a spiritual kind of a dark spiritual thing, which is the accent. And I looked up, uh, they said they were 437 years old, and that day would have put it 17 or 1551 in Germany. And that was the height of the German witchcraft trials, uh, was going all through Germany, the German witchcraft trials. And... Um, I, as wild as it sounds, I have personally have reason to believe everything she said for reasons that I've stated here. And it still hurts. I miss her to this day. And the last time I spoke with her, I was getting married. And she called up, you know, life marches on. And uh, she just said, Timothy, Timothy, it was the last thing she said to me. She says, when will you understand? She said, people like you and me will only be happy. We're not meant to be married. She said, people like you and me aren't meant to be married. And the sooner you accept that, the happier you will be. Those were her last words to me. And then I didn't hear from her. I couldn't contact her. And um, I was married, so I didn't try. That marriage didn't last. That ended horribly. I was done, I was done terrible, honestly. I don't end marriages. They ended. I don't believe in divorce. I don't. I believe in love, reconciliation, and people staying together. But it takes two. I just want to make that clear. I want to make that clear. But yeah, I had a horrible time with that, and it didn't last. And I've been alone ever since. I've been alone ever since. 
And then I got curious, I got on the internet looking for her. Well, let me back up. I think I did hear from her. In about 2012, I was living alone. In a, an, out in the woods, there were no houses around me. I mean, this is the trailer I talked about. Two stories about the trailer in Sopronius. I lived, I was very isolated. I lived out there all by myself. There wasn't any houses around or any traffic. I was really out there. So it couldn't have been somebody else. But I heard her call my name. And I knew instantly, it's Simone. It was her voice and her German accent. Yeah, Tim, Tim. It was her. She sounded in distress. And I thought, that's Simone, that's Simone. And I said some prayers. I'm, I'm certain, I remember I took it serious. And I said some prayers for her. And a couple years later, I did an internet search for her name. I never came up with anything trying to find her email address or some way to contact her. Because by now, computers are way in, cell phones, and, you know, I should be able to communicate with her. I'm not married anymore, and I want to find her. And, um... Letters went unreturned, went unanswered. And then I tried again and I found her. And as soon as I saw her, I typed her full name in and her city. And there was her name. A new post. And I saw the name of the site, the website that her name was on. It's in Gedanka Zaita. In Gedanka Zaita. Like in reflective memories. And I thought, oh, no. That's like the German equivalent of saying, you know, when you're thinking of somebody that's passed on. And um, in memory of, in Gedanke, Gedanken, in Gedankenseite. And I thought, oh, no. I clicked on it. And there she was, pictures of her. And uh, she'd passed on. And I could read German, and somebody that knew her said that she went suddenly, no one could save her. Oh, somebody said that in German, she went suddenly, no one could save her. So, oh, I've got to include this. Not a very pretty, but very odd to me was pictures of her on that site weren't like the pictures I showed you here are the two pictures I have other pictures and she's beautiful in all of them well the pictures of her on that site was her all right unmistakable I've never seen anything like it twisted grins she looked at the very image of insanity I don't even know why anybody would post pictures like Every picture of her looked like a tormented, twisted person. I can't even describe to you. And I showed pe people that I know those pictures. And they took them down. And even if they didn't take the site down, they did. I wouldn't share those pictures with you. Because I don't want her remembered that way. She looked the very image of dark, twisted insanity. It didn't even look human, just her, her grins were twisted and exaggerated. Her eyes looked crazy. There was, and other people that saw those pictures said there's something unnatural going on here and not good. And they all agreed with me, yeah, that's not natural and that's not good. It was disturbing, her images on her Gedankenseite memorial site. So... That's the story of Angel, my Angel, and the Berlin Hexen. And is witchcraft real? I'm inclined to say yes, that people can sell their souls to the devil or whatever they do to get involved in the dark arts. And to try to get out, I don't know. I don't know, it's all speculation. I did a lot of prayer before I, I came into this video, and... 
I won't hesitate to unlist this if I see any reason to take it down. Because I'm talking about somebody that, real, the mother's gone too. And I don't know what happened to her, I couldn't find it. But uh, somebody real and somebody extremely dear to me. And I have prayed for her multiple times. And I didn't get hit with any negative feelings or anything. So intercessory prayer for her angel. Uh, she wanted to find Christ. But she was involved in something. Some kind of dark spiritual group, the others, the really bad ones, particularly. She called them the really bad ones among the others. We're pretty upset with her for talking to me, wanting to, wanting to get Christ. She wanted free of it. And she wanted free of it. But otherwise, um, what did I about her? Um, I found it odd in her room, her bedroom was full of uh, a lot of medieval, authentic medieval things, um, weapons and shields, and she had some exotic animals. She had a monkey, a pet monkey. She had a parrot. Uh, up in her attic were uh, her former parrots and pets, dogs that were um, stuffed, taxidermied. I went up in the attic, it was creepy, I had all these stuffed pets, dusty looking, staring at me. And uh, she was quite an exceptional person. Um, she was on TV in, in Berlin for this and that, and she was uh, quite popular. I was very honored to know her and to be a very special person to her. And time marches on, doesn't it? Where do the good times to the people go? You live to be my age and older, and looking back at some very dear people to you that have passed, and you know, her and I talked about spirituality quite a bit. I don't think she ever dreamt that she was going to die young. Um, she didn't have to go through getting old and all this decay, you know. So, I don't know. I guess that's about all I've got to say about her on this, and um, yeah, if I could ever go back in time and revisit, it would be my time spent with her. So there, I've shared something very personal with you, but the moral of this is about witchcraft, people dabbling in the occult. And then wanting to find Jesus Christ, when they meet somebody that knows Christ, supposedly she said I did, and they want to get out of it, and she wanted out of it. Uh, she had a hard time getting out of it. So people don't mess with the occult. Were they from the 15th century? Maybe we're all, maybe I was alive in the 15th century in another form. Yeah, I don't know. But that's, I have reason to believe what she and her mother more or less said, I have reason to believe it to be possibly factual. All right, that's all. Take care. God bless. Gott schütze dich.